keep your Bibles open to that passage in John chapter 17. We are on holy ground this morning. We are listening to God speak to God. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, Jesus allowed his disciples to hear his prayer to the Father. And the disciples are allowing us to hear Jesus. His prayer expresses the longing of our Savior for his people. Today, tomorrow, forever. The chapter begins, Jesus spoke. These things. Jesus has been speaking to his disciples about God in chapters 13 to 16, and now Jesus speaks to God directly. And his prayer is summed up for us at the end of verse 1 Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. One way to think about this concept, to be glorified, uh, means that what you are on the inside shines out for others to experience. In God's case, his nature, his identity, his perfection, his holiness, his beauty. From Genesis to Revelation, we learn that God's main is that he be glorified. And Jesus is praying for the invisible God to be made visible and known. This is the goal of the gospel. So how is God glorified? Well, God is glorified as Jesus, verse 4, completes the work that the Father gave him to do. What is this? Well, two things. Firstly, the Father and the Son are glorified by the Son's work at the cross. Verse 1, the hour has come. Now, the hour has been steadily approaching in the book of John. It is the hour of Jesus' death, the hour of glory, the hour when the heart of God goes public for everyone to see his love, his mercy, his justice, his wisdom, his power, all seen most clearly and fully. Jesus here prays for the world to see God's glory in his death. Have you seen? So firstly, the Father and the Son are glorified at the cross. Secondly, the Father and the Son are glorified as they transform people. You can see that at the end of verse 2, where Jesus gives people eternal life. And eternal life is defined for us in verse 3 as knowing God. It is knowing things about God, yes, but it is so much more. It goes beyond knowing information to knowing God relationally. Eternal life is to know God personally as Father. God is in the business of transforming his enemies into his children who know and who love him. And this transformation of people reveals who God is, especially revealing his grace he shows us that he is not distant, he is near. He is not cold, he is kind. He does not give his people what they deserve. He gives his people what they do not deserve. <clears throat> he changes us, and in doing so, he reveals himself. This is his glory. So God is glorified as the Son accomplishes his mission going to the cross, dying for his people. And God is glorified as Jesus accomplishes his mission to transform the people he rescues. 
And so how does God transform us? What does it look like? Well, in verses 6 to 10, Jesus describes the transformation of God's people in four stages. Firstly, if you are God's child, you belonged to the Father in eternity past. Verse 6, Jesus says, they were yours. Jesus is saying that the Father set his love on you before anything was created. You were in his mind and his heart before you even existed. He knew you. He loved you. He committed himself to you in eternity past. Mind-boggling, isn't it? Secondly, if you are God's child, the Father who has known you from all eternity gave you to Jesus. Verse 6, Jesus says, I have revealed your name to the people you gave me in the world. Think about this. Christians are a gift of love from the Father to the Son. What a profound and humbling truth. Thirdly, if you are God's child, Jesus revealed the Father to you. Beginning of verse 6, he revealed the Father's name to you, and at the beginning of verse 8, he gave you the Father's words. God has moved towards you and given you new life, eyes to see him, hearts to receive him, a will to obey him. You have been transformed by the living God. So these first three stages of our transformation should be a great source of assurance. God's sovereign grace should give our faith a stability in this life. Why? It's because our faith is rooted in God's grace, not in our fickle decision-making. If it were up to us, we wouldn't choose God, and we would continue in that rebellion forever. But God graciously invades the lives of his people in salvation. Doesn't that encourage you to keep going in the Christian life? To not give up. God sovereignly set his love on you. So keep going. Now those first three steps are God's initiative. The fourth involves our response to all that grace shown to us in steps one to three. Fourthly, if you are God's child, belonging to the Father in eternity past, given as a gift of love from the Father to the Son, have the Father revealed to you by Jesus, then you will have responded appropriately. You will have responded in faith. Verse 8, you received Jesus' words. You believed what the Father sent him. You will have responded with knowledge. Verse 7, Jesus says, now they know. Verse 8, they have known for certain that I came from you. You will have responded with obedience. End of verse 6, you have kept the Father's word. So verses 1 to 10 describe how Jesus is glorified. He accomplished the work that the Father gave him, firstly by going to the cross, secondly by rescuing and transforming God's people. Now in the rest of his prayer, Jesus is going to pray for these people who continue to live in this world. And he's going to pray for three things. <coughs> firstly, he prays for our protection. Secondly, he prays for our holiness. And thirdly, he prays for our unity. And then he finishes by giving us a promise to hold on to so that 
we will persevere to the end. This is what our Savior prays for us every day. Firstly, Jesus prays for the protection of God's people, verses 11 to 16. In these verses, Jesus prays for our spiritual safety. He prays to the Father, verse 11, protect them by your name that you have given me. And verse 15, protect them from the evil one. Why do we need protection? Well, remember the context. Jesus is going away, and his disciples are troubled. And so he is comforting. God's children, including us here this morning, need comforting. Because we, verse 11, have been left in the world for the time being. And verse 14, this world that we have been left in is hostile to God and hostile to God's family. We need Jesus to pray for us because there are two very real temptations that we encounter uh, when we encounter hostility for our faith. Firstly, there's this temptation to compromise and conform to the world. The world hates those who, verse 14, are not of the world. And so the temptation for us is to belong to the world so that we won't be hated. The temptation uh, is for us to become moral chameleons, blending in with the world opposed to God. The temptation for us is to wear a disguise so that we don't look like God's children. I think all of us are tempted to do this uh, individually, maybe among work colleagues or neighbors, friends, or even family. They might know we are Christians, but sometimes we feel the need to compromise so that they don't feel threatened, or so that we can just avoid that hard conversation, or so that we can be liked and not hated. We've all done it. But we can find great comfort knowing that Jesus is praying for us. There is another temptation, and that is the temptation to isolate ourselves, to retreat into our Christian community and have little or nothing to do with the world. The temptation to compromise comes more often at a personal, individual level. But this temptation to isolate ourselves comes at that personal level. We might do it individually, but it can also happen at the level of a church. The temptation to disengage from the world is perhaps particularly a temptation for independent evangelicals such as ourselves. Wonder, is there some area that we have given into this temptation as a church, as a whole body, to retreat? But Jesus wants us to not only be aware of these temptations, but to act with courage because he's praying for us. Notice that Jesus here doesn't pray that we would be successful in blending into the world or so that we would be successful in isolating ourselves from the world. And he prays that we would be kept by God in the midst of life in this world. And he prays that we will remain God's children through this great danger of being in the world and being of the world. So firstly, Jesus prays for our spiritual for our spiritual perseverance. Well, how does the Father answer that prayer? How does God keep us in his name and keep us from the evil one? Well, secondly, Jesus prays for the holiness of God's people. Verses 17 to 19. The Bible tells us many ways that God keeps us close to himself so that we persevere. But here, Jesus specifically prays for our holiness. This word holy or sanctify 
means set apart. We are set apart from the world by God's truthful standard, his moral standard. We are kept set apart through the truth of God's word. Amazingly, not only is God's word the source of the world's hostility towards us, and it is the thing that sets us apart from the world, it is also our protection. This is so important for us to see. God uses the instrument of his word to keep us holy, to keep us close to him, to keep us from the evil one. We remain God's children when we hear the Father's voice calling us back to himself. And that is one reason that we take the Bible so seriously here in this church. The world is full of voices, tempting us to stray. But God's voice is clear and true, and he calls us to himself by name and directs our lives by his word. And if you think about it, we are here this morning because the Father answered Jesus' prayer. Look at the relationship between verses 17 and 18. Jesus prays that his people would be set apart by the word, verse 17, so that they could be sent into the world. Verse 18. That God's people are kept close to the Father as they are sent into this hostile world to tell others the truth. And when people who were chosen before the foundation of the world, given to the Son, who in turn revealed the Father to them, when they hear the truth of the gospel, they can respond in repentance and faith. This has happened over and over and over, generation by generation, down through the centuries. People saved by God's voice, kept by God's voice, sent by God's voice. And it meets us here this morning. If you are a Christian, you have heard God's voice and responded appropriately. Why? Because God has kept others before you. He has caused others to persevere. It's like we have this spiritual family tree, and Jesus prays again for us this morning as he did for our spiritual ancestors. So Jesus prays, firstly, for our spiritual protection. Secondly, he prays for our holiness. Thirdly, Jesus prays for the unity of God's people, verses 20 to 24. And I think that we can apply Jesus' prayer for unity in two ways. Primarily, as Ingleton Evangelical Church, Jesus prays for us that we would be unified internally as a local church. We are several dozen people who are all very different. We differ in age, in background, in class, in life experiences, in family history, in Christian maturity, in personalities, and so forth. Now, of course, the biggest threat to this disunity from within is our own sinful tendencies. But there's always potential for disunity and fracture as we sin and as we are sinned against. And so Jesus prays here for us as a church. But Jesus also prays for us that we will be unified with other Christians. There are all kinds of reasons that there is potential for disunity among the worldwide church. There are cultural, historical, denominational, theological reasons for disunity. And of course, there is sin. And don't get me wrong, there are legitimate reasons not to be unified with churches who are in error. We must stand firm on first-order gospel issues, such as who God is, what Jesus came to do, how people are saved, 
what people are saved from, whether the Bible is man's word about God or God's word about everything. Jesus is not saying that he wants us to be unified with people who are in serious theological error. But sadly, in reality, much of the time we're prone to disunity with God's people over petty things, especially personal preferences. The worldwide church is incredibly diverse, and there is potential for disunity and fracture. And so therefore, Jesus here prays for the church. He prays for individual churches. He prays for the worldwide church down through history. And he prays that we would be unified around two things, namely. Firstly, Jesus prays that we would be united by the gospel, verse 20. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. We believe in Jesus because of the eyewitness accounts recorded for us in the Bible. This book is a reliable record of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And so we are to be united around that gospel message as it's presented in the Bible. Secondly, Jesus prays that we would be united by the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Verses 21 to 23, he prays that his church may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. I've given them the glory you have given me, here it is, so that they may be one, as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me, so that they may be made completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me, and love them. As you have loved me. Wow. Verses. We have been made God's children and we grow in our family resemblance. Because God the Father and God the Son are united, we have been made part of God's family, welcomed into his family. And we are to seek unity with one another. Thirdly, Jesus prays that we would be unified by our eternal power. Verse 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, so that they will see my glory, which you have given me because you love me before the world's foundation. Jesus wants us to be united around the same goal. What is the goal? Where are we headed? To see Jesus face to in eternal glory. So let us not be naive in seeking unity with other Christians, but let us be unified as we are able. With one another in our church, with other churches in our community, with the worldwide church. This is Jesus' prayer for us. One final thought before we finish. Jesus ends his prayer, verses 25. 26. Righteous Father, the world has not known you. However, I have known you. And they have known that you sent me. I made your name known to them and will continue to make it known, so that the love you have loved me may be in them and I may be in them. In verse 26, Jesus makes a promise. And he will continue to make God's name known to God's people. With the result that we would be brought into the circle of God's love forever. Jesus, Jesus promises us this morning that he will never stop. He will never stop making God known to us. So that we would grow in our family lives. Loving one another. Loving the world we are sent into. And so this week, I think, we should strive for spiritual perseverance, for holiness, 
for unity. For two reasons. Firstly, because Jesus' prayers, this is Jesus' prayers. We can have confidence and we can go forward with confidence because Jesus' prayers are always answered. Secondly, because Jesus always keeps his promises. Let's have a moment of prayer. Father, we thank you for your Son who prayed these words for us so that we would be protected, so that we would be holy, so that we would be united by your word. We pray that the effect of us gathering together this morning would result in his prayer being answered. To you be the glory forevermore.